Welcome to Destiny. We're happy you're here. Take a look at what's coming up. Life is better together. We would love for you to get connected and join a life group. Stop by the Welcome Center on your way out to find a life group near you. Mark your calendars, Friday, February 15th. We want to invite you to celebrate recoveries for your anniversary. We're going to have a great time. There will be food and a special word from Pastor Obed. We hope you can make it. High school students, we have exciting news for you. The house is now every Wednesday at the Student Center. For more information, check out at It's the House on Instagram. Thank you for joining us today. For more information, follow us on all streams of social media. We hope you enjoy the rest of service. I love you so much. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you so much, baby. Mm. I really love you. <clears throat> I love you. Amen, 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 amen. There you go. So glad you're here today. Wasn't that awesome? Did you guys like, um, I don't know, Pastor Jeff, he's, he, could be a, he could be an actor, huh? You know what I mean? Like, perfect. So we learned all his skills on Thursdays, because usually Thursdays at 12 noon, our, our staff just goes bonkers, because it's kind of like we're so drained and everything. But anyways, we're glad you're here today. Just a few announcements I want to do. When you walk out today, you're going to grab one of these cards. They're going to give them to you. Um, we have a tremendous ministry here called Celebrate Recovery. And um, a lot of people think it's just for people that have addiction. But it really is, to me, I find it more about it being a great community um, of people that help you continue to be restored and replenished. And on um, February 15th, um, it's kind of like an, it's our four-year anniversary but it's, uh, it's going to be almost like an open house. And uh, I'm going to be speaking. And if you know anybody um, that w you know needs that kind of community, um, sometimes they won't come on their own because they just think it's per se, it's for people that are addicts or anything like that. But, you know, it's just a healthy community to come to. So I'm going to encourage you to grab a couple of these, invite them. And if you have to come with them, come with them. Because I promise you, it's a safe place for them. And somebody that at one time, as a young boy who was hooked on drugs, what I needed more importantly was not somebody pointing the finger at me, but actually pointing me somewhere where I can find some help. And so I want to want to make sure you do that, and it's going to be fantastic for that. Well, I'm excited about the word today. Are you excited about it? Come on, can you stand and give our online audience a big, big, big round of applause right now? God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for watching. 2 Corinthians 5, open up your Bibles if you can, if you have them, your iPads, iPhones, whatever you are, whatever you have, 2 Corinthians 5 has been our theme verse for this month in our series called Irresistible Love, and uh, so glad to have Jimmy back with us again this weekend, and uh, so honored you're here. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, it says, for it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and Maybe you're here for the first time and, you know, you're like, man, this church is, they're really into it. We're not a loud church. We're not a, a crazy church. We're a passionate church. We, we have the love of God inside of us, and that's what fuels our passion. You know, I, I'm a big USC football fan, and when I go to the games, um, I take off my pastor hat, I put on a fan's hat, and I yell. Sometimes it's not good yelling, okay? Um, but we're all passionate about something. And I, I've always dreamed of having a church that really loves God and is passionate about it, enthusiastic about it. You know, heaven's not going to be quiet, so we might as well have rehearsal on earth, right? It says, for it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us because we're absolutely convinced. I've already been persuaded that he has given his life for all of us. I, I want to talk to you today that I think is going to be a hallmark message today. And maybe you're here and you're probably, why did I come here today? I really believe God sent you here. I'm going to talk to you today a message I've entitled, 
love like you've never been hurt. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive, a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say amen. You may be seated. If you don't have a message outline, our ushers would be more than happy to get you one. We kicked off this series last week called Irresistible Love. And every February, we do a message or a series on love. And over the past few years, it's always been more love being horizontal, how to love people. This year, we felt as a pastoral team and amongst all of our campuses that we would concentrate more on this love being vertical, more about being loved. I was moved by a story that I read recently about a man named Satchel Paige. And the thing about Satchel Paige was that he was a right-handed pitcher and at the age of 42 in 1948 was the oldest league rookie while playing for the Cleveland Indians. He played with the St. Louis Browns until age 47 and represented them in the All-Star Game in 1952 and 1953. He was the first player who had played in the Negro Leagues to pitch in the World Series. And in 1948 was the first electee of the Committee on Negro Baseball Leagues to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1971. What struck me about Satchel Paige was a story that has been documented. One day he was pitching and everybody knew of his, of his confidence and that he had such skills that people never seen. And one of the things that he's known for today was what you would call the freeze pitch, that he would wind up and then he would freeze and then boom, go really fast and, and throw the ball. And today you see a lot of pictures doing that. Well, one day they were playing a team and and when they got to the stadium, the fans were harassing him, calling him the N-words and throwing stuff at him. His teammates were trying to kind of guard him a little bit. And so he heard that this team wanted to intimidate him by getting their four best players and putting them up to bat at first. Usually in baseball, you get one or two, and then that fourth one is the cleanup hitter, and they're going to knock him in, and then you kind of put the next best one at number seven or eight in the lineup. But they decided we're going to put all four up front. He kind of saw that as a joke, like there's no way you're going to intimidate me. So when he getting ready to face the first batter, he signaled to the outfielders, hey, you guys, go inside the dugout. They looked at him almost startled, and he says, yeah, go inside the dugout. So the outfielders ran inside and they sat in the dugout. The other team didn't know what he was doing. Then he turned over to his infielders, his first baseman and his third baseman and his second baseman, and he says, why don't you guys sit down on the bases? Now the, the team was like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Well, he struck all three out. The fans got angry. When he was walking towards the dugout, they started throwing stuff at him and with more intensity called him the N-word. His coach grabbed him immediately and says, are you fine with this? Are you okay? We won't let you go out again. And he said something that's the premise of this whole message. And he looked at his coach and he said, coach, I've learned something from my mother. Love like you've never been hurt. See, in Christianity, they paint this picture that once you accept Jesus, everything's going to be good. Truth is, you're going to get persecuted one day. One day, someone's going to stab you in the back, and one day, someone's going to hurt you. You're going to have members in your family that are going to hurt you, and it's not if, it's when. It's not if you're going to get stabbed in the back, it's when you get stabbed in the back. It's not if. You get betrayed, it's when you get betrayed. You're probably here going, God, this is going to be a somber message. <laughs> no, I'm going to encourage you. I love what Paul writes about. In Ephesians chapter 3, he says this, and may you have the power to understand as of all God's people should. And look to the depth that he goes to. He says, how long, how high, 
How deep is his love? May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. There's this love that God wants every one of us to experience. Matter of fact, Paul equated, and he said this, knowing the love of Christ with being filled with the fullness of God. So in other words, being loved by Christ means you're full of God. And so in some sense, what he's saying to you and I that's so important is that we have to understand that our love only comes by being loved. This is why John writes, and he says this, we love him because, everyone say because, he first loved us. In other words, what, what John was trying to get to know us and what Paul was emphasizing to us, he was saying this, being loved gives capacity to love. The fact that, that I get to experience the love of God, in some sense, gives me the capacity to love. This is why one day Jesus was dealing with people that thought they understood what love was. The scholars, the Sadducees of those days, and Jesus would always often speak in parables or in stories. And Jesus was giving them this illustration that I believe many of us need to understand. And he, he talks about it in Matthew chapter 18. He says, then Jesus called a little child to him. And that's why I use a lot of illustrations. He, he called this little boy and he said this. He set him in the midst of them and he said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become a little, as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was letting them know this little boy, in some sense, has probably never been hurt. He's probably never been rejected. Probably has never been talked about or talked down to. So therefore, there's this, this sense of this young boy being very secure. And not only is this young boy very secure, at the same time, he has no problem trusting. See, every child that's born isn't born to love until they first learn how to be loved. When a child is born, I saw it twice, that they would immediately clean up my daughter and my son, and the first thing they did after they cleaned them up is that they gave them to my wife, and she laid them on her chest. That My little daughter was beginning to hear the heartbeat that she had heard while being in the womb of my wife. She felt this love. And so as Jaden began to grow up and Judah began to grow up, they would cry. And when they would cry, they had, they had no second guessing that mommy would grab them and either give them the bottom or give her her life and, and, and she would feed them. When, when our boy and our girl would, 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 would want to feel carried, they, 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 they never thought twice. They would just kind of run to us and they would lift their hands and they knew mommy and daddy would always pick them up. There's a sense of security that a child has when knowing that they're loved gives them this, this strength to, to trust and be secure. Well, every one of us will grow up. We will feel things that our life was never meant to feel. We will go through things that our life was never meant to go through. And little by little, Trust is broken. And yet we sit there and we in church and we're like, we're going to give you six steps how to trust again. And then you still struggle to trust. Hey, we're going to show you five ways how to forgive someone. And then you, you struggle to forgive. But the true premise is, is that if you just go back to the origin of just learning how to be loved again, then you'll go back to the place of being secure and going back to the place of being trustful. See, your trust and your security is not dependent on what you do for others. 
It's what you allow God to do to you. That, he, that you allow him to lavish you with his love. And being hurt, being thing, and being rejected are really the roadblocks that you have for being real. One of the first roadblocks you have for being real is that you just don't want to have again the fear of being hurt. Like Pastor Obed, I, I, I want to be able to trust and I want to be able to be secure, to be honest, but, but, but it's so hard for me because I just don't want to get hurt again. Well, David talks about it in the book of Psalms, and he says this, Before I confessed my sins, I kept it all inside. My dishonesty devastated my inner life to be filled with frustration, irrepressible anguish, and misery. The pain never let up for your hand of conviction was heavy on my heart. Watch this. My strength was sapped. My inner life dried up. Like a spiritual drought within my soul. And here it is. Then finally, I admitted to you all my sins. In other words, I found once again that I can finally be loved and be real. Because the first thing that happens when trust is violated is not to be real with that person, but to first be real with God. Then he allows you to be real with others. And then David goes on and he says, refusing to hide them any longer, I said, my life-giving God, I will openly acknowledge my evil actions and you forgave me. All at once, the guilt of my sin was washed away. And watch this, and my pain disappeared. Isn't it amazing that we're first trying to fix the problem horizontally? when we should first fix the problem vertically. That if I can be open with God and allow him to love me and lavish his love with me once again, the fact that I am being loved gives me the capacity to love. I love him because he first loved me. See, Pastor Obed, I struggle to be real, not because I don't want to. I just, I just have a fear of being hurt. The second thing is that you have a fear of being rejected. You have a fear of being rejected. I love what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalms, David speaking again, and he says, I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. <laughs> like, in other words, sometimes I just struggle with my own struggles. And the enemy wants you to believe that you're the only one that has these struggles. And this is why I love life groups. And the reason why I love life groups, and the reason why I love being on the dream team is because you get around other people that got complexities like you. We all have some complexities in our life. But David acknowledges that. And he says, everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. At the end of the day, I can be rejected by man, but I'm never rejected by him. The beauty that I get is, is the security of no one's going to rob me from being loved. Therefore, nobody will ever be robbed of me to loving them. My, my capacity to love is, is first being loved. Pastor, I want to be real, but I fear of being hurt again. I, I feel of being rejected. And the third thing is that you have the fear of being exposed. You just have the fear of being exposed. The Bible talks about it. 2 Corinthians 4, it says, we refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes, and we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do, everything we do, and say it out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see. If you don't have a place, if you don't have a crowd, if you don't have friends that you can be open with, then they're not your friends. Then it's the wrong crowd. There's a place and an environment that you must have that, that you're able to be open. That's why I love worship. Because worship reminds me of Job, naked I've come and, and naked I'll go. God, I can just worship you because at the end of the day, it's, it's, I'm so overwhelmed by what's happened to me this week, yet I could just come to you the way I want to come to you, and you're never going to reject me. You're never going to expose me. 
No, God, what you're going to do is you're going to cover me and you're going to accept me. See, the idea of being loved gives you the capacity to love. Say, Pastor Obed, how, how do I love like I've never been hurt? How do I actually do that? Here's the first thing. Number one is remember forgiveness is not about keeping score. It's about losing count. Forgiveness is not about keeping score. It is about losing count. Can I tell you that, that even the disciples had this issue. They, they wanted to bring out the scorecard, and they were like, hey, God, we know along the road we're going to get hurt. We know along the road we're going to get rejected. We know along the road we're going to, we're going to get talked about. Where did, they, where did they get all that from? Simple. They saw it happen to Jesus. They saw him do miracles, and the same people later on would talk about him. Man, they saw that when, that when he came riding down a donkey into Jerusalem, the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then just a couple of hours later, when he was brought before the people, and they said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They saw it with their own eyes. They said, oh, man, what we're signing up for, I don't know if we're ready for this. So they asked this question. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Because on the eighth, it's a new beginning, which means I have a new beginning that I'm not going to let them sin against me. I, I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to hold on to it. And, and look at Jesus' response. He said, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. Like, God, really? 490 times a day? <laughs> like, you mean to tell me that I really got to forgive someone? Yeah, yeah. Because forgiveness is not about keeping score. It's about losing count. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to let anybody's dysfunction and I can't let anybody's hurt begin to taint my own heart. When at the end of the day, I bring my heart before God every day. And God is so used to seeing a heart that's wounded and a heart that's striped and a heart that has a bunch of scars on it. But this is why we're to bring our hearts to him every day and say, God, can you just wipe that hurt away? God, can you just wipe that pain away? God, can you just wipe that stripe away? And let me tell you something, you will get love like you've never been hurt before. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to be able to love people that don't even deserve the love because you've been loved. Loved by the Father himself. Love. Love like I, I've never been hurt. Because here's what you have to understand about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Let me, let me, let me break. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a choice. When we make forgiveness all about the emotion, we will never make the choice to forgive. We get so drowned in the emotion of what they did to you and what they did to me that it leaves us no choice but to be angry, to stay hurt. But you're the one that has to decide. Because at the end of the day, choices lead, feelings follow. If you're not careful, you will allow the follow, you will allow the feelings to lead. And then you're going to land up making the wrong choices. You can't allow your feelings to get in the way of the decisions you're going to make that affect your life. Part of forgiveness is not just letting go. Part of forgiveness is choosing to say, I refuse to stay this way. I refuse to live another day with anger in my heart. My future is more valuable than the moment I'm feeling right now. I refuse to. But Pastor Obed, you don't understand how much they've hurt me. I don't understand how much they've hurt you. But I do understand 
you are still left with a choice. And do you want to choose to stay bitter instead of getting better? Do you want to choose to stay angry instead of living a life full of joy? They may have caused a feeling to come over your life that maybe you weren't ready for. But at the end of the day, you're still left with the choice to either stay in it or get out of it. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness, come on, is a choice. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is a, it's a choice. The second thing I got to do is I got to sometimes believe that the worst things done to you bring out the best in you. Just think about that. Sometimes the things that have been done to you, they bring out the best in you. I want to park here for the next five minutes as I get ready to close. Because I want to share a story with you that I believe is going to absolutely change your life. David found out that a king that was very dear to his heart had passed away. It was customary in those days that if you were in a relationship as a king with another king and they passed, someone passed away, that the king would send what they would call men of kindness out of their courts to bring gifts, spices, to bring some sense of assurance of joy. It's what David did. The Bible talks about it in 2 Samuel 10. It says, it happened after this that the king of the people of Ammon died. And Hanan, his son, reigned in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So his intention was, I'm going to show kindness. He says, so David sent by the hand of his servants to comfort him concerning his father. David's servants came to the land of the people of Ammon. And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, their lord, Do you think that David really honors your father because he sent comforters to you? Has David not rather sent his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow? Isn't it amazing? I'm going to park there for a moment. Isn't it amazing? How so many people are skeptical of your kindness. They always believe it's an un, there's an underlining factor. I've had so many people sit there and they said, man, I was just waiting for the punchline. And I'm like, there's no punchline. We just love you. How many times have you been so kind to people that you went with the intention of being so nice? And yet their response was so suspicious that they are just trying to go, what, 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 I, I don't know if I can believe them. What if they're really trying to take advantage of us in this moment right now? Will, what if they have the worst intent? No, no, no. This, let, let me help you out here. Please. Please. Don't exchange your robe of righteousness for the robe of a judge. Because at the end of the day, the worst thing you can ever do is judge someone's intentions. Look what happens. The Bible says, therefore Hanan took David's servants, shaved off half their beards, and he cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks. That's, that's in the Bible. And sent them away. When they told David, I want you to see this. He said to them, to the men who were greatly ashamed, wait at Jericho until your beards have grown and then go back. See, in those days, a man's beard represented maturity. It also represented rank or position. And yet the garments that they wore, if they were going to openly expose you to shame you, what they would do is that they would take the back of your garments 
and they'd cut a big hole so that your buttocks would be exposed. You'd be ashamed. You would walk around with your hands trying to cover yourself. These men that went with such great intentions of just wanting to be kind were manipulate, were, 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 were the byproduct of people who manipulated their kindness by trying to cut their maturity and, and bring shame to their lives. And I love what, what David did because this is the greatest lesson on how to learn how to live your life without ever being hurt. He said to them, don't have them come back to us, but send them to Jericho until their beards grow back, until they get their stature back, till they get their maturity back, till the day the shame is knocked off of their lives, and then have them return. See, there's a reason why David said go to Jericho. Because here's what Jericho means. It means a sweet fragrance or a sweet place. It means the sweet spot of a second chance. Can I tell you that, that, that when they went, and they went with this, this sweetness of bringing kindness, but yet because of their dysfunction and their lives being so sour, they try to put their sourness on David's people's sweetness. It's what people do to you. They put their sourness on your sweetness. And if you're not careful, you will walk around with your hearts being so sour that you begin to lose the power that God has given you to be kind and to love and to forgive. And instead of walking around with such a sweet smell and fragrance of the sweetness of grace, you land up walking around with the sourness of something you've never initiated, but yet you became a byproduct of. And you know, you know what he said? He said, run to Jericho. Why? He says, because when anybody sprinkles sourness on you, always run back to the sweet place of my grace. Run back to the place where God's going to lavish his love upon your life so that you're not wearing the sourness of somebody else, but you're wearing the sweetness of his forgiveness and his grace upon your own life. Pastor, what do I do when I get hurt? Run to Jericho. Pastor, what do I do when somebody's trying to throw sourness on me? Run to Jericho. Pastor, what do I do when I feel rejected? Run to Jericho. Pastor, what do I do when I feel ashamed? Run to Jericho. Can I tell you something, church? It's time for the body of Christ to run back to Jericho. Because it's the place. It's the place. It's the place that you experience the sweet fragrance of his spirit. And this is when you get to the place where you're not denying the hurt. But you are not wearing it. Because you ran to the right place. Jericho. Jericho, that's the place. It's called Jericho. And you say, Pastor Obed, I, I, I don't have a Jericho to run to. Yeah, you do. It's the presence of the Lord. It's, it's, it's you can run to him every day. You can run to him every day. Because cause here's what I can't promise you. I can't promise you that people are not going to throw sourness over you. It probably will happen. But you know what you do when they do? And they try to put on that sour coat that they're wearing and the sin they're wearing. Here's what you do. You, you, you have it on because they've attached it to you. But you run back to Jericho like I do every morning. And I run to the sweetness of God's grace. And I intentionally take it off. And I say, God, I wasn't meant to wear this. I'm not meant to wear what somebody else is hurting over. I'm going to lay it at your feet because I was meant to wear the sweet grace of God. And this is why they don't understand that you can love them like you've never been hurt when it's been their intention to hurt you. Because at the end of the day, you're not wearing their hurt. You're wearing the love of God which gives you the capacity to love other people. Come on, am I talking to somebody today that says, Pastor Obed, I'm going to run to Jericho. I'm not going to wear hurt, pain, bitterness anymore because guess what? L 
forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a what? It's a choice. And I get to choose today. Come on with every head bowed and every eyes closed. I know it's a little late. It's 1026. But I'll get you out in 10 minutes. But I got to be, I, I got to honor the Holy Spirit right now. I truly need to honor the Holy Spirit, and I need you to honor him with me. But he's here right now. And as I was praying, and our, we normally don't do altar calls because we just believe God can touch you where you're at. But over the last few days, the Spirit of the Lord has been dealing with me, and he said, Son, there's people here that need to know how to run to Jericho. And maybe you're one of those today that, the sourness of sin you've been wearing. Or maybe the hurt. Maybe there's an issue where you're like, I just don't know how to forgive them. It doesn't start with you confronting them. It starts with you confronting God. And just saying, I need you to love me so that I can love. Maybe you struggle with forgiving yourself. You're trying to do everything you can possibly to make things work. And it's... But if you don't know how to be loved, you won't love. If you're here today and you say, that's me, Pastor Obed. I need to run to Jericho. I'm going to ask you as our worship team gets ready to sing. I'm going to ask you... By the Spirit of the Lord. I, I wish I can go and pray for everyone, but I can't. So I'm going to ask you to come forward. And if that's you and you're saying, that's me. I need a touch from God today. I need, I, I need to, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to get up. And I'm asking you to come forward. One, two, three. Why don't you get up? And why don't you come forward right now? In Jesus' name. Come on. It's a holy moment. It's all it is. No embarrassment. You're, you're, in the, you're amongst the right crowd right now. You're amongst the right people. This is where you can be you. You could be real. You could be honest with yourself. You could be honest with the Lord in an environment like this. God, I, I need to run to this Jericho right now. In Jesus' name, I thank you. And I give you thanks today. 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 In Jesus' name, I give you thanks. I give you thanks today. I give you thanks today. In Jesus' name. Are you hurting and yes, God. Yes, God. Overwhelmed yes. by the weight yes, Lord. of your sin. 